One prominent application that took place a few years ago, three years ago or so, uh, which is image captioning, which is now they have a lot of deployed kind of systems. These big companies, they do have that, Facebook, Google, and what have you. And the idea was very simple. It's just you're going to sandwich a, a so-called ConvNet, follow it with recurrent neural network. We know recurrent networks are good for sequences. And the idea here is that if the so-called CNN can transform an image into a representation and classification, we can use that optimal uh, representation of images after training the CNN, and then we use this to drive a recurrent neural network to generate a text. And uh, therefore, we have a text associated with, with every image. We do it on training data. and they exist some training data, we'll see examples of those. And then after that, the idea is that if you deploy the system and you give it an image, it's going to write some paragraph trying to describe what's in that image. And so you see what the status of this thing is. So, uh, so this is the step. So the idea is that you have a CNN and you want to have the output of a CNN by your choice. It doesn't have to be the classes. You could go prior to the classes. We'll show you in a second. And somehow insert that into the recurrent neural network. In this example, we're showing a simple RNN. And then you train it like we train it on a text associated with that image. So for the, in this case, you want to have a starting. Your sequence is going to have a start, which is the beginning of a sentence. So some token that represents a start, some vector that represents that. And then you have a straw <coughs> hat. And obviously, when you have a start from this image, you're going to produce for you a straw. And then you take the straw, you produce the hat, and then the hat will say the end of the sentence. And therefore, you generated an example text associated with a specific image or a picture. So this way, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, using the CNN, you could tr train the CNN offline by itself, let's say on ImageNet, a lot of images, and there are a lot of uh, examples of very well performing CNN on data sets such that the image net, you can take one of the uh, particular structure that won some of these competitions. And the idea here of this image net, you have the image, you have the classes at the end. So one suggestion is that you can remove some layers from the end of this well-trained CNN. And you say, I want to have the representation up to this layer. That's arbitrary, obviously. Because the idea here, this vector here, is a good representation of an image. And you're not really now interested in classification. You just want to have a very effective uh, representation of the image. So you use the CNN as just a transformation that takes an image and gives you a vector representation. And that's the choice that they have. So they eliminated, in this case, the last two. And they say, okay, now I have a vector, like in this vector is 4,096 elements in this vector. I'm going to see if I couple that with an RNN. And the way they do it, they just go to the model of a typical simple RNN. And they say, okay, one way of, to couple this one with the RNN is to take this vector multiply it by a matrix to generate the same dimension that you wanted at this point, which is in this case. So here's the vector from the CNN. Here's the matrix to make sure the dimensions here match the dimension of your recurrent neural network. So we said this is like 4,096. Let's say you choose a recurrent neural network of 100 hidden unit dimension. Then clearly this matrix is going to be 100 by 4,096 matrix which you could also include it in the training of recurrent neural network. So this is how you drive the recurrent neural network. So you have this vector, which is uh, for every image going to be fixed, and you could train this weight. You could Obviously, you train the weights of the recurrent neural network as well. 
to generate that text, like we've learned on the uh, code example. And, and the idea, you have some representation that said, here's the beginning of a sentence. So that's a vector, unique vector that you have to identify to a single for us beginning of a new sentence or a paragraph. And that's what drives this one here. And for this image, if you supply this image, it's going to give you an output. And after training, you hope that this output will be the right sentence associated with this image. And then you do the so-called concept of sampling in recurrent neural network, where the concept of sampling, you have the output here. The output is going to be a vector. We interpret all the outputs here as probabilities. And you don't necessarily pick the one with the maximum probability. The concept of sampling from statistics says, no, 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 you don't just go ahead and pick the one with the largest probability. You just say, I'm going to have the full probability set of each one of those elements, and I'm going to use some function that does the sampling. So you have a distribution, and every time, this sampling mechanism is going to select out of these vectors. So it, it, it follows a distribution and picks the most likely over the distribution for that event. And that's how you generate your sentences, by the concept of sampling. Okay. And you just, so here, presumably, this one, in this case, maybe gives you a straw. Then you output, and the output will give you the next vector. And then this last vector, if it's the end of a sentence that you trained on, it's going to give you the token, which is the end of a sentence, which represents a period. Okay? Concept is very straightforward. And you just sandwich two blocks together in a sequential mode. The convolutional neural network is already trained separately on a data set. If it's ImageNet, then you talk about millions of images. And you just remove a few layers at the end. Typically, you remove the last two or so. And then you have a larger vector which represent the image in a vector form that drives now the recurrent neural network. And, of course, you do the training for this recurrent network on images. And there exists a lot of data sets. One popular data set is called COCO. Uh, uh, it's a Microsoft data set. This COCO has images in the order of 120K images at this point. And each image has associated with it five sentences, which sometimes they use people to do it. They use Amazon uh, capabilities, and they have people for every image, they write the five sentences associated with the image. So that exists as a training data available since 2014. And, and that, I think maybe two years ago, was 20K. So we don't know exactly what the number is. You can look it up and find out. But at, at least so here, this image has five sentences associated with it. And you train it on this image. And this just shows you examples, success stories. Uh, they trained it on, in this case, you can see that they trained in one sentence. So it generates a sentence, and, and it, it looks like these images, which are not part of the training data, it's part of the testing data, generate something, something that's reasonable. However, at the same time, you have images, because we're still like in the, in the development phase, if you wish, which generates things like that. So here it says a young boy is holding a baseball bat. So obviously the network mistaken this toothbrush for uh, uh, a baseball bat. This one's in a cat is sitting on a couch with a remote control. This one, a woman holding a teddy bear in front of a mirror. So here's the teddy bear and here's a woman. And so this is, this is an example of things that are uh, failure, I guess. And uh, the idea is that uh, after the simple RNN, people have looked at more sophisticated uh, gated recurrent neural network. And the one that popped out as a, as a very super capable kind of recurrent neural network is LSTM. And uh, so you can do the same thing. You have images, you have an LSTM, you have representation, same trick, except now use LSTM. There are more sophisticated stuff that adds attention to it, which is we don't going to discuss it here. Uh, so a model of a so-called simple RNN, you could also, by the way, create a layered of RNNs. So you have one RNN 
drives another RNN, another RNN. Typically, people use, in, in, you know, two to three layered RNN. So you have each one recurrent neural network, but they're driving one another. So here's uh, a generic model for these things here. We're suppressing, in this case, uh, the bias. So really, you have nonlinearity, typically a 10, and you have a, an augmented matrix. And you have what's driving this one would be, in this notation, they use H, T is the time, L is the layer. So this is H at layer L. You need HT here, and you also have here H at the same layer, T minus 1. So that's exactly the model we have. However, you could also have another term which comes from a prior layer. So you could couple the time and the layering together. So And, and this is trying to be abstract here, but of course you can add the bias to it and what have you. This is really the model just generates from a single layer RNN to multi layers. Typically in RNNs, they only use few layers to just enhance the capability of uh, uh, an RNN. Uh, in an analogous way, if you talk about LSTM, uh, what is the connection, or at least how we describe the model of LSTM? Well, LSTM is going to have gates in addition to the same main body of the simple RNN. So here in a compact form, and we're going to revisit this model again, you say if you also include layering, uh, so here you have an activation from a previous layer, which could be the input. You could actually replace with this one here by the input signal, okay, which is coming from previous layer. And then here is the same layer, but now the previous time, and you produce three gates signals, all of them have nonlinearity sigmoidal, so it would limit the gating signal between 0 and 1. And you have one signal here, which is the main body of the simple RNN, like we talked about, which we typically use hyperbolic tangent in this case. So you put all these signals, and the people at Stanford, they order them this way, and they call them IFOG or something of that sort, just for people to remember it. But the point is, from these signals, that's where you create the so-called memory cell. The memory cell is just a combination of gating signals. You have I, F, and O. These are the three gating signals. And this G signal is the main body of the simple RNN. So you have the input gate that controls the simple RNN. You have the forget gate that controls this memory cell, previous memory cell. And then... This memory cell passes through nonlinearity, hyperbolic tangent, and you have an output gate. And that's how you obtain the final activation. And I, I like this one here. They actually combine the time and the layering in case you want to use multi layers of RNN. So one feeding the other one. Any questions on this structure, geometric structure? So there are a lot of Fancy diagrams, people look at the equations. A lot of people in some fields, they don't like equations. They prefer diagrams, so they have various diagrams. That one diagram that came with the original paper is this diagram here. The original authors have this particular diagram. So imagine that this one here is the simple RNN, and these are the three gates. And each one of these gates is used as a control signal to control whether you're going to pass this simple RNN, this multi multiplier, the pi here is just multiplication, simple multiplication, point-wise multiplication, if you have vectors and vectors. So this one, a gate for passing the simple RNN signal. This is a gate for passing the feedback of the currency of the memory cell. And this one is a gate taken from the memory cell out to the output. And this diagram is sufficient, but there are a lot of people who go into fancy ways of drawing a lot of diagrams. To them, maybe it's clear. To others, may not be clear. So I think the equations capture the whole thing. And if you look at this one diagram, that's sufficient to understanding. And the original LSTM, long short-term memory LSTM, appeared in this paper in 97 by Ho Ryder et al. And you can look at the geometry of what happens here 
And the price we pay for LSTM vis-a-vis -vis the simple RNN is that we have replica. We have four times. So we have three gates. Each gate is just a copy, the same size, the copy of the simple RNN. And what you pay in terms of price is that you have four times the parameters. So it just replicates the same parameter of the simple RNN, and you end up having four times the parameters. So the first three guys here are gates, and this is really the simple RNN, and you, you connect the simple RNN through this memory cell, and this is the output. So here you have all these gates. This is really the cell, memory cell is the model. And these guys are just generating all these other signals, the gates and the G signal, which is the main simple RNA. This is the model in geometric form. Any questions? The transition from simple RNN to LSTM. We're generating four gates. They were obviously, you know, uh, you know, extra careful if you wish. They generate a gate anywhere they can to make sure that they control the single trans uh, the signal transition. So the concept of a gate in the extreme case, the gate could be zero or one, meaning you let the signal pass if it's one, you shut it off. So by shutting off, when the input gate is off, for example, what happens to the cell, memory cell? The memory cell state will be just repeating. Okay, so imagine that I equals 0, F equals 1. Then whatever the memory cell is going to be fixed, going to see. So the state of the system will be constant. And if you follow that, what happens to the gradient descent when the state is constant? It turns out the gradient descent is not going to grow. So the, these measures were intuitive measures. Their objective was to make sure that we overcome the problem of the gradient descent uh, vanishing or exploding. These are the two phenomena that has been observed with a simple RNN if you are handling a long sequence, when they call it dependency. If you have a very long sequence, this long sequence, when you pass it through forward, it's going to be a long sequence. It's going to generate a long sequence on propagating error, and the propagating error is going to be propagating the error signal multiplying by weights. And if any of these weights is growing at every time, you have an exponential growth over time, potentially. So there are other variants. So since then, I think in uh, the so-called GRU in 2014, there's another model which is described here. And the key point in this model is called gate recurrent unit RNA. What is the difference between this GRU neural network and LSTM neural network? One, they reduce the number of gates from three to two. Every time you reduce a gate, you get rid of all the associated weights, you get rid of all the gradient computation for these weights. That's a time saving. And they have, so this is, their modification is that they have only two gates. They rename them as reset uh, gate, um, reset, and there's uh, this Z uh, gate, set and reset. So reset is one gate that's applied to this H, T minus 1 here. And then the other gate, the Z gate, which is applied to the part coming from the simple RNN and the part which is the memory cell. Bottom line, if you look back and see what is the connection between these things, and if you want to keep the same parameters to see exactly what's the transition from LSTM into a GRU, I'll show you that in the slides later. But right now, one observation is that we reduce the number of necessary gates. And if you look at the cell, the cell doesn't have input gate and a forget gate. It has only one gate called Z, 
and replaces the input gate by 1 minus z and have the forget gate is the same as z. So imagine this z is going to match exactly the forget gate for the... And now instead of having forget gate and an input gate separate, independent, they say, no, 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 we're going to have one gate, we're going to have one of them here, and the other one will be the complement, one minus one. Meaning if this is one, this is going to be zero, and vice versa, in the extreme case. So they said we can do away with with three, two gates instead of three. So that's, of course, there are other papers, and here's another reference, 2015, where people try to explore various models. Can we reduce these models? And, and you show you here, when you look at them, they have various reductions, arbitrary reduction. They just ran on the cloud numerous different variations. This group was from Google, and they had a lot of resources. They just let, ran things uh, by modifying the uh, models, and they got something that appears to be working on some data sets. There is no logic to what they've done. It's just like randomly look at all the possibilities and see which one is better for that data set. So it was em empirical exploration of what makes one not work. So the driving note here is that there is a consensus or belief that, yes, LSTM works very well. However, LSTM is computationally expensive, if I want to replicate that. Another thing, there is a belief that maybe one doesn't need all these different gates. So the belief that this LSTM is redundant, has too many parameters for what it needs to do. So these explorations are trying to get something that's more compact, less parameters, saving the time of computation, and something that remains or achieves the same performance. So FLLSTM in speech translation, for example, achieves 92%. You want to replace with something else, you have to be in the same order in terms of test performance. So, so, so this is their summary, which is uh, the RNN has obviously flexibility. The simple RNN doesn't work because of some issues. In some cases, when you have long sequences, referred to in the literature as the vanishing gradient or the exploding gradient. These are terminologies you may hear from some people. The LSTM GRU, uh, they improve on this gradient flow. And uh, the explo uh, ex explosion and vanishing is reduced or eliminated. You could do it by clipping and uh, a simple RNN, but clipping is just a, a quick kind of fix. It's not really theoretically supported because you could, it's just delaying the instabilities. That's what clipping does. So the simple architectures, so here's the key word that you get from this one. Better simple architectures are a hot topic of current research. Better understanding of both theoretical and empirical aspects of recurrent neural are needed. Okay? So the last two here, bullets, are extremely important. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So let's see on other fronts here. So, so I'm going to have my notes here following the simple structure. Now we saw diagrams. We're going to see some math here. And then in this one here, I added things that's not on the handout that I gave you, but I added the these definitions. Just instead of having them everywhere, I just wrote them once. And I'm going to update this. Update this. This is the only difference here. Just the sheet. I listed the terminology for all these definitions. And I'm going to upload this modified thing with, with this one slide changed. So this one you have, we're talking about creating this memory gating that prevents the instability. And gating, gating, gating is the key word that uh, overcome the limitations of recurrent neural network learning. And I also share with you a tutorial uh, at this website. And there is a, a book where the original form of LSTM and other forms are available. It's just for 
supplementary notes, but I think we, we have the model here. So uh, this is the notation we used for simple RNN and a diagram for it. And the concept of memory, this is from one of the references, uh, which really just shows you what the additional term is, the so-called so memory or C cell. And you have this cell is going to have feedback, it's going to have gating at the output, gating at the input. And what comes at the input is really uh, the input coming from a simple RNA. So you have a simple RNA is going to feed into this cell. This cell has all these three controls. That's, that's the LSTM model. And then here are the equations, the same equation we talked about. So you have uh, your three gates. You have a temporary storage for the simple RNN. And then you have the memory cell action or how it combines the simple RNN with its own previous value. And you have the gating signals control. And you have the output gating. So this is just breaking down the model mathematically. <coughs> And what I put in a box here is that in that reference, you may have some other variants of these forms. Uh, this additional thing here doesn't really change any, anything, so you can just remove it. And therefore, you have the gates just the same form for simplicity. But some in the literature insert different terms here and there. Okay, So for uniformity, you can just say all these gates are the same. This is the... Uh, the accepted kind of procedure right now, just the gates are replicas of the simple RNN, and the key aspect is here in the memory cell combining those things. This product is pointwise. I use the star, which is notation for Python. In mathematics, they use a dot with a circle around it. It's also mathematically known to be the Hadamard multiplication, where you apply two vectors pointwise. Okay. And Sometimes in coding, the way they describe the model to make sure they lump everything together in a larger vector so you can do one operation at a time or one function. So you could have augmented matrix that has all the Ws of the gates and the simple RNN, the Us and the Bs, and you call these one intermediate variables, and therefore... All these gates with the simple RN, you can have it as a, a, a representation like this. So that's easier for coding and just doing one operation at a time in parallel computation instead of computing each one sequentially. So often they lump them all together. They have a bigger model like this. This is the description of the cell. You take each one of those so-called states for the gates and for the cell, you combine them to generate the cell, and then the cell uh, combined. The sigma here stands for sigmoidal function, to differentiate it from the hyperbolic tangent. Sigmoidal limits it between 0 and 1, we view it as a gate. And I'm just adding here the simple RNN model, okay? Uh, just for completion, there's some models that people propose, uh, which is, in this case, called the initial RNN. And these people, they suggested using a different nonlinearity for the simple RNN and different initialization. So they initialize it where this matrix initialized as the identity. And they shown that the simple RNN could work in other cases. Okay. And this iRNN model is available on Keras. You can download that and run it and see how that tutorial example worked. The simple RNN is also uh, available with clipping you make it work for some examples and the LSTM also the main component in recurrent neural networks available on Keras for us so this is the model now I'm gonna see uh, from this model what is the gated recurrent units that we just talked about how does it relate keeping the same scenarios so I'm gonna have uh, use the same notation as LSTM for the cell. And, and instead of ZI is the input gating, and here 1 minus this one, and this is the output gate. So you have an output gate and input gate. 
Note here, I'm using the same notation as LSTM to make a transition from LSTM into the GRU. And I highlight differences that for the GRU, instead of using the H, they use the C. So I'm highlighting this in red. So the way I do it, I just go back to the LSTM model, retain the same notation for the cell, not change it to a different name, and not change the gate to a different name, and say what had happened to the LSTM to transform it into the so-called GRE. And this is the exact transformation. And what happens here is that the gating signals use the cell memory instead of the activation H. The simple RNN uses the activation H. The activation H doesn't use nonlinearity, use only gating, drops the nonlinearity. And therefore, in the GRU, in addition to losing one gate, you observe, when you look at it, you on, have only one hyperbolic tangent H. So here you have one hyperbolic tangent, which is, appears here, doesn't appear anywhere else. Where you compare it with, a, with the LSTM, you have hyperbolic tangent here, and you have a hyperbolic tangent here, duplication of hyperbolic tangent. So these are the key advantages, or at least differentiating factors, between the original LSTM, which is the workhorse of recurrent neural network, and the GRU. Now, so the GRU has one nonlinearity and loses one gate. And of course, there is saving computation. Saving computation by itself is not enough unless the performance is good, or at least comparable. So this group, in various references, they claim uh, that, at least for the set of data that they uh, tested, the performance is comparable. And they acknowledge that this is only initial testing process, and further processing has to be done. So that's, that's a fair game. That's good. Because they're saying, okay, we test for these things. We can achieve comparable performance. So that's good news because we can do the same activity or performance with less parameters, less computational cost. Uh, but they're fair in saying that we only can claim this one for this data set. And further data sets are there. And since 2014, these groups and other people have been testing this model, other data sets. And the report is that uh, pretty much they seem to be comparable. Any questions on the so-called gated recurrent units RNN, which is GRU? So we lose one gate. And in fact, also, you lose, you drop one nonlinearity. So if uh, you're using many of these recurrent neural network in your model, such as what people do in, in language translation, Google Translate, they use eight at least eight recurrent neural networks in, in developing the system for translation. And, you know, you, you can see what's the dimension of the activation function, typically no less than 100 units. So you can actually estimate the savings in terms of the number of parameters that you drop or got, and also the associated training activation and gradient descent associated with it. There is even... In 2016, there's another group that came up with another refinement that says minimal gated units. They call it MGU, recurrent neural network. And they said, we're going to drop another gating signal. Okay? So we can emit another gating signal. And instead of having, we only have one gating signal, we replace this one instead of the output. We just say, no, we're going to use the same gating signal even here. So obviously, even every time you drop one, you drop like you know uh, matrices that have dimension 100 by 100, and each one is doesn't need training. So that's another model that came out 2016. They introduce some implementations or at least uh, tests for MNIST and some basic data set. Uh, the jury is still out. Uh, we haven't seen too many 
what further uh, testing on those things. So people are still considering this, but uh, it did not have as many testing as the other ones. So the difference here, you can take this one gating signal and and use the same gating signal, replace this ZO here by ZI. So you only have one gating signal that appears on those three places. And they claim, and the papers, I believe I uploaded them in the, under the references. They have a folder for you, references. It includes these papers. And you can look at the graphs in these papers. And you can look at the tables for their performance. And you can see the data set that they include in that test. So actually, this model, uh, you can quickly modify this one a little bit and just say, uh, perhaps I don't even need this gating signal here. I can just have nonlinearity here. And so I only have, so this modification, which I'm suggesting for you, is that you have nonlinearity only here. You took nonlinearity from the other places. You only have it in here, and you took away the gating signal. And yes, in this case, you still have one gating signal. So this is a simpler model with one nonlinearity. So, so here, instead of having nonlinearity here, we have the nonlinearity applied here for the activation. We don't have this gating signal in three places. We only have it in three in two places. Uh, so you have one gating signal, use it to have a convex sum between the two terms here, and you get this expression. Okay, so, so that's another variation of it, a very simple, straightforward variation. Any questions? Any questions? on LSTM, or the so-called GRU, and how you make the transition. And these are only activities that happened since 2014, 2016. These are the current things, because people uh, are aware that there are a lot of changes that need to be made because of redundancy. Uh, all these models, they require a huge uh, sizes of recurrent neural networks and also replicas, many of these recurrent neural networks, to achieve some practical applications such as language translation. So, any questions on this? If no questions, then I'm going to go to the next handout. Yes? In the minimal native uh, unit, so they remove the output, correct? Yeah. So and they move one of them, yeah. Which is I call I call it here the output, yeah. Which is really its presence in the yeah. So it was there was a gate that was here. They said no, we're going to use the same gate here, and therefore we get rid of this one. So if you compare it one to one with the so-called GRU, it also has two gates, has the main simple RNN, and uses one here and one here, different ones, right? So these people says we can use the same ZIT here and get rid of this. So this again was just a um, attempt to uh, reduce, reduce the gating and, and of course gating. parameters and computation. Okay. Yet and you can just you want to make sure, exactly the guidance is that you don't want to lose performance. Right. Okay. Or at least you reduce it to a level that's acceptable for your application. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're allowed to reduce anything you want. You can put them all zero. Right? I'm just giving you. So, I mean, the idea is that they obviously, when you reduce it, you're saving tremendous things. Right. So the trade-off, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I showed you this other things where people went arbitrarily crazy. or oh, not here. In the, in the other handout, right, where the Google group just... Look at all possible combination of things, right. and was all like you know crazy, just uh, trying to find maybe where's the optimal model. Mm -hmm. Okay.
for those applications. They they have things that it doesn't have any any uh, logic behind it, but it, it's driven by computational. So just to flash this one again. Uh, as long as the output is comparable or the trade-off is. Yes, yeah. you you make your criterion, and criterion would be. Uh, yeah. So here, so here's the. So there's something called MUT1, MUT2, MUT3, and you can look at those things. This is variation of GRU, and they're saying for this gate, I'm not going to have feedback from the activation. This one, uh, I'm, I'm, so these are the gates are different. This is different. So they have different variation. And here they add hyperbolic tangent here. So there are a lot of different uh, heuristic method of trying to come up with another model that has less parameters but maybe achieve similar performance. And they test them. Everything that they have here, they must test them on some acceptable data set. Uh, typically starting from uh, you know, basic data sets and then go into more complex data sets. OK, so, so let me delve into one, one approach that we pursued here at MSU. Can I ask one more lingering yep. question before we uh -huh. get into this? Okay. So there, I, there was a question I had about the um, CNN driving the RNN. Yeah, okay, sure. So, yeah, I'll wait till you get to the thing. Okay. Uh, yeah, that works. Okay. So the, the features that, that we're taking from the CNN, putting it into the uh, hidden layer of the RNN. Yep. So, so what we're doing is we're saying that I have this trained CNN, and basically this feature set that I'm that that I'm inputting is whatever features that that they have that indicates that this is a straw hat picture, basically. And then the RNN takes this and says that all right, I read these features, and I kind of see that it's a straw hat or something. So yeah, I mean, you obviously have to go through the training process, right? Right. So right. you take this trained CNN. Mm -hmm which is going to give you a representation of the image. The image could be any size, and now you end up with one vector. In this case, they chose one 4,000, which represents the image. So far, the CNN just says, here's the image. I'm going to give you this vector that represents it. give you another image, I'm going to give you a separate vector, right. and so on. This is just a, a transformation or representation of the, of the image. But then it has to be trained, because it has to be a copy. Right, so prior. So this is just a... You view the CNN as a coding process that takes an image to the image and give you a vector mm -hmm. representing. And then, then you start the process of training the CNN, which you're doing it here, and you take this output and you put it in this modified model. From this, instead of this model, you have another term here, which accommodates the output of that CNN. Mm -hmm. you, you have this V, which is constant while you're doing the training. So this V during the sequence is going to be supplied there and, and sitting there until you do the training. And while the training is supply the data, the sentence, through this X, through a sequence. And you produce the output. And here's the process. You begin with something that says, I'm beginning a sentence. You supply the input image. And you do the training, I'm sorry, the sampling here after the training. But you do the training first, and then when you sample, you just have this one produces for you the sentence. And eventually, when it's the end of the sentence, produces the vector that represents the period. Any other questions? <coughs> so uh, let me repeat. So as you can see here, the last two things that are highlighted is that you need simple architectures, there are hot topics, research, and then understanding. These are things that are currently of great interest throughout. So I think a year ago, uh, we, have, we have these models. So let's just, we started with this LSTM. We've shown you what happens when you take the STM, you create another so-called GRU, reducing one gate, the MGU, 
RNN reduce two gates. Okay? These are the key things. So in this uh, thing, and I have references uploaded for you, a prior work, pub published work, with some data and, and images and, and graphs that you could see. And the concept is very simple. Very simple. So you, you, let's say we focus on LSTM. We have three gates. These gates, they're going to produce zero and one for us. These gates are controlled or driven by the, what's inside them here. And they have three parameters each. Right? So the focus, and this is your model. The focus is which ones of these terms are needed to drive the gates. Okay? So, observation one. These gates, they have the input signal driving them, and the input signal is also driving the cell. Right? Question one. Do you need the input signal also driving the gates? Why? We're asking this question because we also have the activation, which is, which is here. This activation appears here. Now, what is the activation? The activation relates to the cell, and the cell has the input already. So if I have the activation, which is driven by the input here, and I have the input, do I need both of those things, or are they redundant? So the conclusion we've had, there's redundancy here. So first modification model, we said, eliminate all the input signals from the gates and get one variant called variant one. So in that case, we don't supply the input to the gates. When we don't supply the input to the gates, what happens? That means we don't need those weights. We eliminate those weights. We eliminate any gradient descent associated with those weights. So there's some savings there, right? So you could see that. So that's variant one. We call it variant one. Is that we just no input to any of the gates. Just showing you your one example of the gates. But that applies uniformly to all the gates for simplicity and, and modularity. So variant one just eliminate the input from the gates. The input only goes through the cell. Because you're processing the input. You don't want to use it for control. The other model is saying... Once we take the input out, we also have the bias. Now, I have the bias, which is a parameter, and we have this thing, UI parameter. Now, when I apply gradient descent to the bias and to the parameter, when I derive it, both the bias and the parameter is going to depend on that state. Both of them are going to be driven by the state. So the key thing is, all you need here is just the state. So if I can have the state somehow represented in this gating, I'm done. I don't need all these three terms. So I can eliminate, eliminate the bias because I have another parameter here, and both of these parameters will be updated from the gradient descent driven by the state of the system, which is the HT. Okay? So another variation is that eliminate the input and the bias. You have another model that only uses the activation. And another model, of course, we can say, what if we, we only have the bias? So I don't need this, the input, I don't need the state. Why is that? Because I am applying also gradient descent. And when I derive the update law of this bias, I'm going to have this update law driven by the state. I'm going to have a form of HT in updating H. So BI here, as it updates over time in the training, is going to contain in it information about the activation. So a third variant is that eliminate this, eliminate this, and only use the biases. Now, when you eliminate these guys, these guys are associated with matrices. So typically, in these cases, at least in the simulations we ran, we use 100 dimension for H. So those matrices will be in the order of 100 by 100. Right? So that's 10,000 parameters, 10,000 parameters here, and so on, depending on the application. So for the input, depends on the sequence, dimension. So if what kind of sequence? Is the sequence of dimension 1 or dimension more? Okay?
So obviously that determines this matrix. So these are the three variants we propose with a logic explanation, <coughs> justification, driven from the fact that you only need information about the state. So what is the concept of state in systems? The concept of state, the state is the variable of a system or dynamic system that contains the essential information about the dynamics of the model. Any variable that over time captures the essential information about the dynamics, that's what you need. You don't need redundancy, the input, this H, this B, and all this other stuff. So that's why these three models. So, and, and you can go back, because you have GRU and you have MGU, they all basically just have different gates. You can apply it to any of the gates. For the LSTM model, you apply it to all the gates, and you get these three variants. For the so-called GRU model, you have only two gates. You apply the same GRU. We call the first one GRU1, GRU2, GR3, just to be, you know, basic. And, and also the MGU. MGU model, also you have a single gate, and you say, I have three terms in this gate. Do I need all these three terms? And can I just have the bias? Or can I have these? So, so obviously, because you have three terms, it's very simple. You have three possibilities, right? If you can base logic, you can have eight possibilities, right? You can have presence or absence from basic logic and stuff. So one possibility, there's nothing here, right? And one possibility, there's all there. So these are the extremes. So you're left with six out of these eight, right? And you can say, I'm going to explore all these six if you want. So you could also have cases where you have only the input. But we found this is not necessary. Reason being is that we can just capture the essential state of a system. Okay, instead of, and, and that's why we limited only to three. Out of the six, we just proposed these three. And, uh, and that's it. That's that's the simple concept. Now, if I go and I say, show me the performance. So obviously, we can look at, here's a paper by actually a former student who took my class years ago. And he was so serious about this. And he was pushing hard. And he was able to uh, uh, actually, in their final project, were, were things of that sort, which he continued afterwards to, to turn it into a, a, a nice uh, a work and paper. So here are the LSTM models, and you have the three variants, LSTM 1, 2, and 3. And the experiments, we opted for the same experiments on these other references. So we took exactly the same data set. One data set that they start with, they use the same MNIST data, which is for images, and they transform every image into a sequence in two ways. One way is called pixel-wise. So you have a 28 by 28, and you just convert the 28 by 28 into one sequence of length 28 times 28, which is 784, each one of dimension 1. So you have a sequence of length 784, here it is, okay? And so each one of them is going to be a sequence. So you take the whole sequence, apply the sequence to the, the RNN, gated RNN, and you classify the sequence into the digits, into 10 classes. All the details are described in this example, and you have another form of converting the 28 by 28 into a sequence of 28 vectors by taking one row at a time. You take the first row as the first element of a sequence, the second row, we have 28 vectors, each of dimension 28. So another sequence of shorter length. Remember, the long sequence is very hard to train. The short sequence is simpler to train in terms of because long sequences, they have what's referred to as long dependency. Okay? And, 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 and that takes a long time. 
and also very hard to get performance. So here we list also tables and the other observation, we use a grid of parameters because with the LSTM or the GRU that's already in the example, they already have the optimal parameters for those sizes. When we dramatically change the size by reducing the parameters, you need to find the parameters that are good for this other modified network. Every param These are called hyperparameters for that reason, that you have to fine-tune them for a particular application every time. Okay? So, so you look at uh, this. Uh, so here's the standard LSTM. And there, one variation, second variation, third variation. Third variation is just you have the bias. You see that the performance for, the, for this particular example is much lower by the bias. Uh, and, and the performance of the second one also, for this case, is lower. But this case is comparable. So it's going to have its own parameter. And you look at the, for this case, when you have a, a long sequence, you count the number of parameters. Because the sequence of dimension 1, you're losing only the matrix associated with the input will be of dimension uh, 100, which is the activation, by, uh, by 1. So just 100 uh, by 1 plus the bias. So we list also the parameters for each case. By the way, when you look at the definition, uh, I'm sorry, let me just, uh, the variance. Yeah, so actually for every one of those variants, we list the number of parameters. So compared to the standard LSTM, it can be seen that the three variants results in this number of reduction of parameters. So you have one, this is the number, so M is the dimension of the input signal. N is the dimension of the activation of recurrent neural network. Okay? So we can actually count how many parameters we're going to drop from each case. And that's how we actually list for you the number of parameters for every study. So in this study, the dimension of the input is just one, so you have the reduction minimal in this case. And if you look at the other case, MNIST, I'm sorry, the MNIST data set. So here's another data set, which is IMBD, which is the sentiment or review, 50 movie reviews, 50,000. This set is also available on Keras. And they have a lot of examples. They use this set and use 25,000 reviews and use the testing for the, for the other ones. And there's a representation. And uh, so here's the comparison among the different variants. You could see the number of parameters here. And you see the performance over a grid of hyperparameters. And you see the performance, for example, in this case, LSTM is better for this parameter. And, and for this case, you have this one, 98. But of course, these guys could achieve 98. Okay? And here is the number of parameters for this case study, total parameters. And we also have associated graphs. And we also have cases. We show the cases where some difficulties in some of these networks, including LSTMs. Uh, And this example shows you that the third one, even though if you limit to 100 epochs, as this study did, it's uh, behind the performance of the other ones. However, when we look at the growing or the slope, it doesn't level off, and we can increase it to more epochs and have a better performance. So we limit this study to 100 epochs, 
because of obviously the computational expense in running 100 epochs. Here's another example, uh, which is showing you the testing for a grid of parameters. And it shows you the number of parameters. So you can see in the third one here, actually this one matches. This one, the three here, only has the bias. And this is the number of parameters, 33,000, compared to 130,000 this uh, case study. So this will be a case study that will be easy, I think, and, and, and in addition to the other papers as well, some of these papers have graphs and data that gives you more uh, hands-on and appreciation of the performance, and you may have, have questions at some point. Uh, okay, so, so any questions at this point? If no questions, we can go to the other paper. Again, it's based or emanating from a project of a student two years ago. And, uh, well, I think it's a year ago. Is it? Yeah. About a year ago, I think. So, uh, so this is the uh, gated GRU which has only two gates. And the same simple modeling of the three variants, GRU 1, 2, and 3. And you have the model of the GRU. And, uh, and then you have the training on the left and the testing. And you can see no discernible differences the GRU zero is the standard, and then one and two in this case. And we here we have three of them. You can see number three is is lagging initially, but catches on. We have more epochs. And this is the three same data sets: MNIST uh, pixel-wise sequence, MNIST row-wise sequence, and IMBD. This form of data, the same data set that these other models have used. So we use the same conditions, same data set in them. Uh, the grids shows you, for example, GR, GR, GRU3, for this case, performance is lagging. Uh, this is for the uh, pixel-wise, which is the toughest uh, sequence. So GRU3 is having trouble in this particular study. However, the other two are comparable. However, they are lagging because the original GRU is much better for this, uh, for this, uh, for the, I'm sorry, for the, for the, the testing is the key thing. Even though it trains higher, the testing is very comparable. And so for this set, they have the same kind of ADA parameter where the performance is very similar here. Uh, this one, GRU1, is not performing for the other test. Uh, uh, because you have less parameters in these variants, you would need the uh, ADA to be much less than what's good for the standard one. Uh, so here they're showing you like GR. GR3 for the testing is lagging when it starts. After 50, still lagging. So because we noticed that this slope is still positive, it didn't level off, we could continue it in some cases for more. And uh, there are cases where we find that the simple, the basic GRU fails, and some of these things work, and, and vice versa. So this is a case study by no means... It's uh, comprehensive, but it tries to cover example uh, cases that demonstrate the equivalence and positive and negative aspects about it. And uh, one key thing about the GRU3, which is just the bias, obviously, the parameters. Uh, 
reduction is tremendous. However, the performance in, in the MNIST data did not catch up, but in the other uh, data, it seems to be catching up. So even though GRU3, you have the same test result. If you only focus on test result, you have the same. Uh, so another uh, uh, model also focus on, uh, I can see it here. I think it's fair to also cover the other one. So here is the other paper by, again, a student who looked at the minimal gated, which we have one gate, and used the same concept of modifying the gates. And you have a very simple reading paper with documentation figures on plots that, uh, that shows the comparison between the original so-called MGU, uh, this uh, shows the sequence length uh, and the parameters that are used. We have, for every learning rate, it shows the performance accuracy. This is a testing accuracy. For the MNES data, 784, which is the pixel-wise. And uh, so for this data, you have the accuracy for the MNES 28, which is row-wise after 50 epochs. So you can see the performance. You can see some plots. Uh, and also, there's some case studies where we can identify uh, limits. So in this particular uh, paper, due to resource constraints, the models in this paper could only be tested for low number epochs. <laughs> so, uh, but I think uh, uh, from some of these graphs, you could see when things level off that not, no improvement is going to occur. So that's... But in some cases, where you see the slope of the graph, uh, I don't know if I have it here. Uh, you could see where the slope of the graph increasing. We don't have any plot, but in some cases where you see the slope is still uh, increasing, that tells you you need more epochs until it levels off. Okay? So I think these are, should be easy reading. The graphs are very clear. This is an exposition of this simple uh, modification that has very important consequences. Now, this stuff here is beyond what you see at the, at the Stanford. So I think that, that this is very current, and I think uh, uh, it brings you to, to a level where, where you are discussing things at the current uh, stage where people are looking at uh, shedding off some of those parameters that are not necessary. I call it redundancy. If there's a redundancy, you want to eliminate all the redundancy in the model because everything you eliminate is going to, is going to be very uh, uh, important for you. When you look, uh, there's a paper, which I'm, I'm not sure I have access to the paper here. Uh, I believe it's in the references, which is the Google Translate model. So in that paper, they use several, I believe, eight recurrent neural network, each one is of dimension at least 100. So, uh, so I, I uh, yeah, I'm not sure I, I have access to that here, but I think it definitely is in the references that I uploaded, the, uh, and, and we use that as a, a go-to kind of deployment or deployed system that's very successful right now. Google claims that the translation among various languages, 
uh, exceeds a human performance. So if that's the go-to reference and you need eight recurrent neural networks, then obviously having these modified things could save in terms of computation. And if I recall correctly, in training that model, they use several weeks of uh, servers computation, cloud computation. Okay, any questions? I, I want to make sure we, we close this topic of recurrent neural network, simple RNN, LSTM, GRU, MGU, and these other variants. So I want to, if you have any particular question, please bring it now, or I invite you to look into those graphs, try to get your hands comfortable with these things and understand what the transition from one model to the other, what gains and what losses. And these are just variant models of recurrent neural networks. They all have positive features and negative features. And of course, to, be, to claim that this is the best model, you have to test it on all the data sets, which nobody has done. So right now, Google, I think two years ago, came up with this Google Translate. They used LSTMs because that was the workhorse at that time that was the leading RARNET. They probably have other models right now. They use other modifications, but I haven't seen them yet. Okay? So if no questions, we're going to just stop at this point.